we bake pastries and breads at the same time in a double-decker wood-fired oven. It's kind of a unique situation. The paracotta croissant is one of our specials. We take our croissant dough and we sheet it out and shape it into what we call a diamond shape. And after we shape it into the diamond shape, we put some ricotta cheese that we make in-house. The ricotta cheese has honey, a little bit of salt, and orange zest in it. The pear is prepared by peeling all the skin off, pouring it, slicing it in half, making a dry caramel. This is kind of a traditional tartatan, but it's just a way to stack them in a sense that we're going to get both sides coated and they're going to bake nice and evenly. We've tried doing it with one person. The extra pair of hands is actually helpful. The pear juice starts to seep down into the caramel and actually reduces it. So that's the pear melt. And after you make the dry caramel, bake them in the wood-fired oven with a piece of foil on top. And so this is just a little egg wash. So this is kind of like adding a nice little natural shellac. Uh, okay, I'm gonna pull those pears out. Now they've been baking in the cast iron for nearly half an hour. So you see how the bottom half is fully caramelized and the top half isn't? So we just want it to be cooked like that all the way through. We're gonna call this paramel. We're gonna keep cooking the caramel that mixed with the pear juice and then that'll become the glaze. Everybody gets half a pear. <laughs> Pretty intense. It's super exciting for me to see a croissant go from the raw ingredients that we've cared for. And so now we're just finishing them, putting them in the oven. And also as a baker, it's a lot of pressure on you because this is the final stage before it reaches the people. Pear juice and caramel, and that's what we glaze it with. One of my favorite seasonal croissants. So now we're gonna fire the oven. This is all hardwoods. Probably, you know, you'll see a lot of oak some cherry, some, a lot of different like poplars. This is really just for soaking in the heat in the masonry oven. You'd be hard pressed to find a single wood-fired retail bakery. There's plenty that bake just their bread. There's some that bake pastry and bread, but they're usually wholesale. We're extremely unique. Yeah, perhaps the only in North America that is baking both pastries and bread out of a double-decker wood-fired oven and open to the public. This is our masonry wood oven, built one on top of the other. The bricks you see here, they're large tiles, really thick, and they're medium density, meaning that they grade the brick according to how many times you can essentially fire it and then dunk it in cold water before it starts to dissolve. I do top-down fires. Top-down style is having it so that the bottom is your heaviest wood. Then you go medium-sized and smaller wood on top, kindling very last. It burns hot on top and then creates like a convective force. The bottom deck obviously affects the top deck and the way you fire the bottom affects the way the top will act. That's right, with one little match, we have a host of delicious things. Now that we have the fires going, they'll burn for the next one to three hours, pretty hot like this. And they'll break down to coals and burn for another couple hours like that before we close everything up, close all the flues, and let it sit like that overnight. That'll be the baker's heat for tomorrow. All of our breads are 100% stone ground flour that we mill in-house. Since we opened 10 years ago, we've been milling. So having fresh flour that is sourced directly from regional farms has always been the heart of what we do and our mission. We got started milling because we wanted that direct connection. It was like, let's take the most basic ingredient and be able to access the grains directly from farmers. Like that is elevating the craft of baking. So this is a, a variety called New East kind of looks like a soft red wheat, but it's actually a hard red wheat. And it's grown um, in Powhatan, Virginia by Pete Sisti, uh, Greater Richmond Grains. We're just loading the grain, pouring it in. We have this nice wheel that allows us to raise and lower the stone. So obviously the closer the stones are together, the finer the flour. This is mimicking the speed of the stone. So right now the, the grain is going through the stones and then it's flowing into here. And it's being separated into different fineness. This is the finest screen, medium, and then the coarsest screen. It takes about 25 minutes to mill 50 pounds. After the flour is done milling, we just kind of clean out these compartments and then we'll mix the first two compartments together. When you smell and eat the bread, 
of a freshly milled flour. It's a different experience. It really speaks to the essence of what a bread is, because you know, if you're gonna make a good bread, you can't hide behind much, especially if you're only gonna have three ingredients. So I'm just gonna start our mixer. It's an old mixer from the 1960s. It's an Italian mixer called a diving arm mixer. It's pretty gentle with the dough. A lot of mixers really beat up the dough, but this one, you can just tell when you're looking at the way it's handling the dough, it's almost as if a human being was taking their arms and mixing it, so I really like that. It's a very, very highly hydrated bread. In the bread world, a lot of bakeries would do like 60, 70%, but we get all the way up to 90% here. And, and I think that's what the water does. I mean, um, I really do think it creates the moist interior and then that like hard kind of crispy crust. We do two to three mixes a day, and our batch sizes yield about 40 loaves. So we make about 80 to 100 loaves a day. So it's a very small scale bread operation. All right, I'm pulling the dough out of the mixer. This is definitely the most workout I'll get today. It's the most backbreaking because you're leaning over and like pulling dough out 10 times in a row. So it's good for your core and your back. Pinch it. And we do shy away from saying sourdough, even though it technically is, just because a lot of people associate sourdough with the San Francisco sourdough bread, but we prefer a little bit less of a sour taste and a little bit more of like a nutty taste. We tend to just say naturally leavened. This is our classic dough. I'm dividing it into one pound, four ounce pieces for our flatbreads, which are the first breads we bake in the morning. I want to create a nice round ball. Like if I were to just put it like this, it would just kind of lay flat and as they proof, it would just be a big blob. I pull some of the dough from the bottom to the top, and then I kind of create a little packet. I take this side, fold it over, this side, fold it over, take the top, fold it over, and then I just take the two corners, I do that again, and then I flip it. And after I divide 42 pieces of dough for the flatbreads, I'll start dividing larger size loaves for the loaf breads. But our classics, we don't use an actual pan to proof it in, we use a basket, so we just put one linen on so we can maximize the number of baskets we put on a tray. I pull the dough from the bottom, the sides, I make a little packet, but instead of taking the corners, a stitch, I do one stitch, two stitches, three stitches, and then I flip the bread over so that the seam is running down the middle. So this is what the oven looks like in the mornings though. It's just empty and then I'm cleaning it. The first thing that we have to do is uh, clear all this ash out of the oven and get the hearth totally clean before we start the, the bake. This is yesterday's fire, today's bread. All right, let's load some breads now. Steam is really necessary for bread, basically for them to fully bake and caramelize. You need to have a moist environment. For us, we use uh, sheet trays with towels. This is our whole wheat bread. This is really the soul of the bakery, as my sister likes to say. That's how we got started. We didn't have any pastries or anything like that. We were just a, a small bread bakery with a subscription service called Subrosa. It's called scoring the bread. You're not just marking it for aesthetic purposes, you're marking it so that it expands evenly in the oven. This is the, the last step, is just to bake these breads off. They just bake in a few minutes, like seven or eight minutes. It's just sesame, nigella seed, and olive oil. And then we do another one with uh, fresh rosemary and, and sea salt. They're like freeform focaccia almost. They're a pretty common bread in Turkey, although usually they're like longer in Turkey. And they'll pull them out, stretch them out like this, and then they'll dock them with their fingernails, like kind of in a line like that, something like that. They'll make a diamond. Um, we don't do that, but that's, it's called turnakide, means fingernail. <laughs> fingernail bread, that does, doesn't sound really great to the Americans, so. We just call it pide flatbread. We spent many summers in Turkey, and we had grandparents stay with us for extended periods of time. And even though they weren't bakers by trade, there was always something on the stove top or in the oven, and visiting Turkey and going to bakeries or having people bring baked goods for tea time. Tea time is a big deal in Turkey. Uh, I definitely think that played a role. We might not have realized it, but it helped create some of the items on the menu and also just, I think, inspired us to want to make and eat delicious food and baked goods. This is the fresh rosemary and sea salt on the same dough, cooked pretty much in the same way, but a little bit more of a, I guess, Spanish twist. So this is our bread coming out. These baked for 34 minutes. Part of the flavor that you're getting is actually like you're roasting grain, if you think of baking that way. You're looking for caramelization 
and the caramelization is where you get sweetness. This is my favorite bread at the bakery. There is something in a retained heat oven like this. There is like a character of the bread that is different. And there is something about the way the masonry soaks in the heat and then the way the bread bakes in that soaked heat. I would say it's more textural though. It's more like the actual overall experience of the bread. It's not like applewood smoked barbecue, you know, where it's like a direct, it's, it's the effect of the whole. Bread was the catalyst for the whole business and yeah. therefore the soul of the business. But we knew that it was croissants that was going to bring people in the door and make for a profitable business. This is our sheeter. We're gonna bring it down into the thickness that we desire. We're gonna take that and sit it, place a layer inside the middle of this dough. So we try to make sure to keep it very square and even. That just helps with the final shape um, of the actual platon itself. So once you have one even layer of butter in there, we're gonna take that over to the sheeter. Add the sheeter, we're basically gonna open up each side of the dough. This allows the butter to spread more evenly. And once we get to our desired width, we're basically gonna fold over. So we're creating layers of butter here. So each one of these has one layer. And when we fold it over, we're completing multiples. So on this first turn, we're gonna have three layers of butter, and then we're gonna triple that on the second turn. Again, we do three total turns of this dough to create all the layers that we have. It's about, I think about 27 layers of butter itself. And then once it reaches its desired thickness, we're basically gonna cut this to the width that we want. So we always start with a clean edge on top. So here we have one of our batons that have been sheeted out and cut into triangles. This is for our plain shape. We do multiple different types of shapes here. This dough was made yesterday, but we're actually gonna be shaping it today and it'll be baked tomorrow. So it's gonna be a three day process. Anytime we're working with croissant dough, we wanna try to keep the dough as cold as possible. Cause it gets cut down to such thin pieces, it'll start warming and proofing quickly. And if it gets too warm, you'll actually start to destroy the layers inside of the dough. So inside of here, there's uh, like 27 different layers of uh, butter. And so you wanna just try to protect those. And that's what creates the flakiness at the end of the day. Croissant is the main dough or the main item on our menu. But then we can take that and do a multitude of things with it because it's such a versatile dough. We can have ham and cheese, we can have salami and cheese, we have fig jam and cheese. Just the amount of things you can do with the dough, really it's up to your imagination to create a shape that makes sense for it. So you'll see a lot of it doing a lot of different shapes. So the, the dough in every single one of the pastries that you see right here is all croissant dough. So you're used to seeing a croissant look like this perhaps, our classic croissant. But we kind of came up with these other shapes based on the ingredients. For example, we used to do the ham and cheese in a croissant that looked just like this. But then we couldn't taste the ham and cheese. It felt like too dense in the middle. So we decided to go for this kind of elongated shape. And now you can kind of eat the croissant and have ham and cheese throughout. We're working on getting all of this and all of this in as fast as we can because we're opening in like 10 minutes. Why well, you gotta move real quick. We try to have the croissants out by the time we're opening. So we don't open without having the croissants out first thing. The fact that if you come in late and the croissants are still proofing, you can't force them to go faster. You can kind of see how the croissant has this nice little lively bounce to it, which means it's nearing the end of its journey. We just work hard to get everything out as early as possible. Now these croissants are out, we're ready to open. We want Sabrosa to be a community gathering place where people meet up with friends, family, where people go alone and enjoy a coffee and a book. We want it to be a place where excellent food and coffee is served. I think we really wanted to create the feeling of old world cafes, like the kind that we might come across in Turkey or in Europe. Slow down, like we want people to go into Sabrosa and feel like they're in a different world for a short period of time.